Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. And to all you beautiful women listening, this is important shit. And even though I wrote that article that said, I'm not sure I trust you just yet. I, we can't do this without you. And, you know, don't, don't be put off by the response of people who are wounded like me, who need a little time. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't need your help. It doesn't mean that it is not welcome. It just means that you have to do some of it on your own. This is your Kick-Ass Life podcast, episode number 371 with guest Laura Robbins. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad you are here with me today. Laura Robbins is back on the show. She was here a few episodes ago on show number 367, where we talked about her being the only one in the room. And we also talked about recovery and we talked about divorce. So if you missed that one, definitely go check it out. And she's back as we have a very important conversation. I just couldn't get enough of her. I needed another 40 minutes or so with her. But before I tell you about her, I wanted to let you know that we have a couple of spots open for private coaching. And I was thinking about it earlier today and I thought, you know what? The biggest reason that people come to work with me or my lead coach, Liz, is they struggle with confidence. And whether they have never felt like they had a whole lot of confidence in their life, or maybe they've had a little bit and they've had some success and it has gotten gotten them to where they are, but they feel like they've kind of reached that upper limit problem they need more confidence, definitely we can help you with that. Again, about 90% of the clients that we work with struggle in that area, so we can for sure help you. Super easy to apply. Just text the word APPLY to 33777. We will send you the link to the application and we'll be in touch about what the next steps are. So again, you just text the word APPLY to 33777. (laughs) All right, for those of you that don't know Laura, let me tell you a little bit about her. Laura Cathcart Robbins is a freelance culture writer and host of the popular podcast, The Only One in the Room. She has been active for many years as a speaker and school trustee and is credited for creating the Buckley School's nationally recognized Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her recent articles in the Huffington Post on the subjects of race, recovery, and divorce have garnered her worldwide acclaim. Find out more about her on her website, or you can look for her on Facebook, Instagram, and follow her on Twitter. So without further ado, here is Laura. Laura, welcome back to the show. Hey, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me back. I am so excited to have you. And and when we ended last time, which was just a couple of months ago, I knew that we needed to extend the conversation and we talked a lot about recovery the last time you were on. And and this time I wanted to to ask you some questions, some different questions. And you've done a lot of writing on HuffPo and beyond about recovery and motherhood and and also about race. And as my listeners know, um, my my predominantly white audience knows that it's something that, that I have wanted to talk about and been unpacking my own Um, my own privilege, my own racism, my own, just the relationship to anti-Blackness, all of, all of these things that I had no idea were even a thing probably before 2015 ish. Mm. And I, I think these conversations are so incredibly important. If we are going to make the world a better place, if we're going to make ourselves better humans. And and I get asked the question every once in a while, you know, what does this have to do with with self-help and and women's empowerment. And my answer to that for anybody that's wondering Mm -hmm. (laughs) is that if you're not, if you're not trying to help all women, then you're doing it wrong. 
And this is such a big part of women's empowerment. So I could go on and on my soapbox box on that, but that's not what this is about. This is this is about you being able to to, have, to give voice to to some things. And so let's start with. I I read your article just a couple of days ago about that you wrote for HuffPo and we will definitely put the link in the show notes Mm. about teaching our children about racism. And I know a lot of my listeners are child-free, but I do think this is an important topic because, you know, this is lessons that they could talk to just people about their coworkers, their family, et cetera. And so can you tell us a little bit about that article and the story that, that brought you to, to write that? Yeah, I I will, and um, thank you for asking me to talk about that. And 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 everything you just said, I I really appreciate you, you know, just really giving this a platform on your show, especially given the demographic of your listeners. I think it's um, it it is so necessary for people like me to have people like you giving us a platform and amplifying our voices. Otherwise, we will never get heard by the people who we need to help us move the needle on these issues. And um, so I I just wanted to thank you and I really appreciate that. Uh, The article that you're talking about, um, I don't remember the exact title, but it's, it was basically my 11 year old got called the N word parents, Mm -hmm. white parents teach your children about racism. And um, you know, I, I wrote that as, you know, it was probably the end of June, I think, of 2020. So in the midst of the protests that were happening around the deaths of various Black men and women at the hands of police and civilians, and I think the world was literally on fire um, as I was writing that one. And I wrote it in response to people who had read a previous article of mine about showing up. It was called white women. I'm glad you're showing up, but I'm not sure I'd trust Mm -hmm. you just yet. That's another one I wanted you to talk about. (laughs) It's very important. We're getting there. So, but a lot of people have read that and then asked me or reached out to me to ask like when and how they should speak to their children about this. And I think that, you know, this type of conversation, this type of emotionally charged conversation around race for parents kind of feels like the sex talk almost like you want to wait until Mm -hmm. they're a certain age and and able to handle the information or maybe, um, you know, it's coming up in your peer group. So you want to educate your kids first, but the, my response to them was that this was not something um, that people should wait for until the quote unquote appropriate time, you know, because my, my 11 year old was called the N word by a classmate of his. It was, he was actually not, he wasn't called the N word. His classmate posted um, on Instagram, a picture of him with that as the caption. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, the thing was that his, his peer, his classmate, I don't think he really intended much harm in doing so. I lost my mind. Like I was furious. And, you know, in, in kind of diving more into the work um, with, like, to investigate really what had happened, you know, it became apparent that this kid really didn't understand the power of that word or what it was like to be the only Black um, kid in this particular class, which my son was, and and mm-hmm. how things might impact him differently. So there, there began my crusade to, like, you know, don't wait until you think your kid might be old enough. And and it's a lot of that is like people want to avoid discomfort. They don't want to talk about these subjects because they don't know how to, because it's uncomfortable, because they don't want to make their kids uncomfortable. But I think the impact that the lack of these conversation has on on children like my son can be scarring and and damaging for life if it's not discussed. I, yes. And I think the thing that struck me, and I, I really encourage everyone to go read it because it it's important that we hear your perspective of how it felt to not only have to go through this with your son, but then to have the the well-meaning mother of the child who mm. who who did this come to you to help her. Yes. 
And, and I'm assuming, I can't remember if I read this in the article or maybe I was reading between the lines that you may have felt pressure by her to make her feel better because we as white women tend to do that. Um, I don't think you did, <laughs> I did <not. laughs> you know, to, to <laughs> consoled her. Yeah. yeah. But, I, but, and maybe that comes with your own experience and that your own work that you've done. But I, you know, the thing that struck me is, is she had asked you like, what can I do? Cause I think she, I think she told you, you know, we raised him to not see color mm-hmm. and you explained why that was not okay. And then she said she wanted to do better. And, and you said, you've got to commit to learning some inconvenient truths yes. and then you've got to teach them to him. And, and that you, you nailed it with like, this is, this is massively uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I have conversations with parents who are struggling to talk to other parents and it's not even about race stuff. It's about, you know, their kid was bullied and, or, or you know, okay. I'll give you an example. In like my friend group, there was this um, kid who's kind of being a, a jerk to the other kids. And one of the moms doesn't want to talk to that child's mom because they're friends ish. And it's an uncomfortable conversation. And, and she comes to me and she's like, I don't know what to say. And she, and then she says, how are you so good at this? And I said, listen, I'm, I'm not comfortable either, but these are, these are things like, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the question that I have to ask myself. What's the alternative? So what's the alternative of us not having this conversation with our children, our coworkers, our, our uncles and neighbors and all of this, it's, it's, we're complacent first and foremost and nothing changes. Absolutely nothing changes. Well, and also I think what we're seeing, you know, currently in the country is the result of not talking of the results of not discussing the results of avoiding these inconvenient truths. Um, for Mm -hmm. since the inception of this country, honestly. And that divide um, will not be breached without these conversations taking place everywhere. That's why we have to teach Mm -hmm. our children how to have them. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It it reminds me of the family. Well, let me back up a little bit. So a couple of weeks ago, I... I jumped into the intro of an already recorded podcast episode that was about to go out with my with my DEI consultant Jessica Sharp who's a phenomenal human being. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about the the expression that's been going around a lot of this isn't who we are as a nation. We're yes. better than this. Yeah. And I when I the first time I heard it, I mean even Joe Biden was saying it, I thought to myself, this is exactly who we are. And then a lot of black women whom I listened to were echoing that and saying mm-hmm. this is exactly who we are. And it reminded me of a Facebook Live that Brene Brown did in 2017 after Charlottesville, Virginia. And she her she had she had a few messages in this particular, it was about a 30-minute Facebook Live. And the thing that struck me the most is she said, if the the story of America is 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 racism is white is basically is white supremacy, and she said until we reckon with that story, mm-hmm. until we reconcile with what what we have done, the way that we have dehumanized an entire group of people, we can't write a new ending to this story. We can't change anything until we admit what's going on. And this might be a terrible analogy, Laura, but it reminds me of a very dysfunctional and abusive family mm-hmm. where only some of the people are really are really um, participating in the abuse. And then the other people are like, we're better than this. Yes. This isn't who we are. It's like the whole family needs to go to therapy and admit this is who we are. Right, right. That's what, how I'm seeing the country. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it reminds me also, and I love that analogy you just gave of, um, Michael Moore's document. I didn't know if it was disrespectful or not. Like, <laughs> no, no. It's I mean, because it's so true. It's so true mm-hmm. that 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 idea that just one of us can be better or you know have 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 woken up or see things differently can't change the dynamic. Everyone must. Everyone has to. That's what allyship is, you know. Mm-hmm. Allyship doesn't exist with just one person helping one other person in this particular situation, everyone has to help. Black women can't do this. Black men can't do this. Brown people can't do this. We cannot change the way things are 
and and everybody's heard at nauseum, you know, a, about the system that has been supported for years and years and years, you know, hundreds of years, maybe even longer than that. Um, that that is is not a system that was built for, includes or takes care of people who look like me. And and so the system is broken. If if people agree that they they don't like the way things are then the system is broken and it needs to be changed and so the people who aren't included in that system cannot change it only right. the people who built it and who profit from it and benefit from it can mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. shopify's already taken the cash register online helping millions sell billions around the world but did you know that shopify can do the same thing at your retail store Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for for a battle-tested solution. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. Today's podcast is sponsored by Midi Health. Ladies, are you over 40 like me and dealing with hot flashes, insomnia, brain fog, moodiness, some vaginal dryness, or weight gain? Don't just accept it as part of aging. These symptoms are often linked to hormonal changes during perimenopause and menopause. At Midi Health, they get it. Their experts know what you're going through and how to help. Midi clinicians are menopause specialists offering safe, effective, FDA-approved solutions. And guess what? Midi Care is covered by insurance. So stop pushing through it alone. Schedule a virtual visit and dive deep into your unique symptoms and health background. You'll walk away feeling heard and with a plan to start feeling better. Visit MIDI Health today and reclaim your well-being. You deserve to feel great. Book your virtual visit today at joinmidi.com. That's joinmidi.com. Joinmidi.com. I've also been seeing the argument for years, really, and I've gotten some pushback from people who are most likely not in my audience anymore, but who who have said uh, you you're being more divisive by by talking about this. And I'm I'm still seeing that argument. And to me, you know, if we're going to run with that same analogy, that reminds me of the person in the family who doesn't want to talk about it mm. because it's you're shining the light on it. Like if we don't, don't admit it, don't talk about it. Cause if we talk about it, then we have to, we might actually have to address it. So I'm going to tell you that it's not actually happening mm-hmm. and that you're actually making it worse by talking about it. Yeah. I mean, which is gaslighting, right? Like, That's true. Yeah. It is gaslighting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, you know what the reality is, but people are telling you it's not the reality. And you need to get in line and act like this, this, this thing that you're being told is the reality. It's crazy making. And it also, you know, completely invalidates that person's experience. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so deep, Andrea. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't believe, and this makes me very sad that I'll see any significant changes while I'm alive. I don't know if my children will in their lifetime. I'm Mm -hmm. hoping that when and if they have children, there will be some significant changes for them. But, you know, my parents grew up with Jim Crow. I was born in the colored ward um, at Illinois Research Hospital. And, And that's, you know, it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. 
Right. You know, and so the the changes that have been made, some are spectacular. Like we had a black president for eight years. That's incredible. We mm-hmm. now have a black and South Asian female vice president, or she's American, but is of descent, um, mm-hmm. African and South Asian descent. So those are those are huge, huge milestone markers, but the day to day of my life didn't change much. Um Regard, it doesn't change much, regardless of who's president, because the system is still the same. You know, right, my, the system is still the same. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it's just going to take a while. That reminds me of of one thing that I want to that I want to point out that I I think is helpful for for white women especially to be able to listen to you know, things like what we're talking about, Mm -hmm. as well as if they are being called in by, by someone. And, and that is something that Desiree Lynn Attaway says, she's a a DEI consultant. And she says, when I'm talking about your racism, I'm not talking about your character. I'm talking about your socialization. Mm, I love that. And I, I know I took a, she also made a meme of it on Instagram many months ago. It was probably over the summer in 2020. And I took a screenshot of it. And, and I, I, when I am talking to someone who's a white person, who's really giving me a lot of pushback and saying, I'm not a racist. And how could you say that about me? And, and Robin D'Angelo talks about this in the very beginning. And I think in the introduction of white fragility and how as white people, we are very young when we are taught that to talk about race, to even point out that somebody is black or Brown is racist Mm -hmm. and, and racist equals bad. Right. You are a bad person if you do that. So that's how we've been socialized. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then obviously it branches off from there and just gets worse. But I found that to be helpful and sort of um, in a way disarming in how it, it takes, it sort of allows people to compartmentalize the topic because when you're in that place of feeling ashamed of your behavior or who you are as a person, you are not learning. You're not hearing. You're certainly not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. And you just are automatically (laughs) feeling defensive. So I just wanted to throw that out there kind of as an aside, if that's helpful for anyone listening. Well, I, I, I think it, I think it will be, you know, I, I know that with my kids who were um, 21 and 22 now, but when they were growing up, if I came at them, like, you know, scolding them or admonishing them, and there was really a lesson to be learned, I, I robbed myself of the ability to offer them that lesson by coming at them so harshly first. So I learned to mm-hmm. change the way I gave them the message, still, you know, telling them what they needed to know in order to navigate the system better next time or whatever it was. But, you know, I, I if once they were scolded, they shut down and they didn't hear anything else. and yeah, that was, you know, that was just a parenting lesson for me. And I think it absolutely is the same for what you're talking about. Yeah. And research shows us that I think it's John Gottman that did some research and he was, he was studying couples that were arguing. And once your heart rate gets to be at a certain level, mm-hmm. you stop listening. Uh, you just can't, yeah. it's like a survival mechanism. And I, I think the same happens when people are having to talk about these very uncomfortable things mm-hmm. No one's hearing each other, so yeah. I thought that was was important to share. I, I want to switch gears in this other piece of writing that you did. When I read this article, and the title of it is, is "White Women." I'm glad you're showing up, but I'm not sure I trust you yet. Yes. <laughs> when I read it, it made me think of when I first moved to North Carolina, and I, I was born and raised in Southern California, mm-hmm. where, where you are. I was in San Diego, and then we lived in Utah for three years, which is very monochromatic. Mm -hmm. And then we moved out here, which is, we were in Greensboro and it was much more diverse and I was on a run. So this was in 2014. This was late in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I was on a run at this really beautiful park. And I noticed that when I would pass when um, the other direction, when I would pass a white woman and I would make eye contact and, and wave I would say 95% of the time they would make eye contact and wave back and smile. Mm -hmm. And I would say only about 40% of the black women did. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that and I completely took it personally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) What's going on? Like, why, why do you not like me? Mm. And I was talking to my friend Kate about it and I told her that and she laughed out loud and she said, Andrea, 
what were you, what are you expecting? Of, of course not. Mm. Like, do you, do you understand like the history of, of what white women have done to black women? And I, and I was like, not really. And so she, she laid it out for me. And that was the first time I ever really understood what you were talking about in, in this article. So can you, can you kind of give us, give us a little synopsis of, of what that piece of writing was about? Yeah. Um, I love that story, by the way. Um, I did get over myself. Well, you know, I'm like that all the time too. I'm like, cause immediately I become so, so centered. And I, I remember once I was like, I, I walked into the library at my kid's school and everyone was whispering and I just knew they were whispering about me. And then I remembered I was in the library and <laughs> everyone had to whisper. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I'm also an addict too, so I <laughs> right? definitely think the world revolves around me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, at the the time of that um, that writing, that article came out of that that same time period. You know, it was, uh, George Floyd was murdered on May 31st of 2020. Right after that, uh, the protests began that you know everyone is aware of and and saw and. What what happened was I was getting hit up by my my white friends who were having these epiphanies about what was happening and and seemed to you know really genuinely want to help. And what the the other piece of that was that as a result of what was happening this time to us, you know, with Breonna Taylor, with Ahmaud Aubrey, with George Floyd. I had never witnessed someone being murdered like that in real time. Mm -hmm. The watching the life go out of this man with the the knee of of a white police officer on his neck while he's asking, begging, calling for his mother. uh, That that gutted me. It shattered me. And I had known about these deaths before. I had even seen a couple that, you know, kind of stopped short as, you know, you see it on the news and then they'll freeze it as the bullets leave the gun or whatever that results in someone's death. But, but this one I I saw and it hit home for me in a different way. And I, I did not know how to help myself in that moment. I didn't know what I could do to rid myself of this feeling that I had. I never had it before. I understand it now to be grief, but it was also anger um, and and just extreme sorrow. It felt so heavy. So to have all these people that could not have been impacted the same way because they weren't Black hitting me up and saying, I get it now. How can I help? It felt, the burden felt even heavier to try to help them because they were just finally waking up to what people who look like me have been experiencing, like I said, for hundreds of years. Like mm-hmm. I've known this since I was able to really comprehend what was going on, probably four or five, that I was different and that I was not, you know, like people who look like me were not the preferred people. I was not going to be the one invited to certain play dates. There were going to be people who would walk down the street and look at me and hate me just because of the way that I looked or my parents looked or the group of people I was with looked. I knew that from a very young age. I have i can't remember a time where I haven't known that. So for people who have you know, benefited from the system in which we live to be calling me and saying, or writing me or texting me and saying, I get it now, I was kind of like, okay, good go do your work. I can't help you right now. And I cannot be, this is, I've never felt like this. This is the lowest I've ever been. So I'm glad you're waking up, but I'm not ready to invite you in to this effort with me right now. I need people that have been in this from the beginning to Mm -hmm. just really just um, commiserate with. And then, you know, maybe we can take some action and you know, a, a lot of these people, like I said, are, are, are they are my friends, um, and I love them, but it, it felt too loud and too needy 
at that point and too bright. Like yeah. people were excited about really understanding this for the first time. It was a eureka moment for a lot of people. Sounds like they were like barging in on your grief. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I, I'm, I have a line in there, something like, you know, you can grieve, but you're not invited to our wake. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really how I felt. And it, and it felt very strange writing that. And the woman who edits my HuffPo pieces, Emily McCombs, who I adore, um, is white. And it felt strange submitting it to her because I didn't, I, you know, I, I, I worry about hurting people's feelings. I, I really do. And at the same time, I, I know that there are things that need to be said. And for some reason, not for some reason, but I'm in a unique position to say certain things because of the access and the resources that I have. So I felt like it was incumbent upon me to say these things, you know, and, 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 and on a platform like HuffPo, which, you know, gets millions and millions of views. So, yeah. so that's where I was when I wrote that. It, it's such an important article and, and that link will be in the show notes as well. And the thing that jumped out at me, I think is, is you said, and I quote, some of us are dealing with unprecedented grief. Mm -hmm. We are broken with pain and unvalidated anger. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I think the only thing, and I'm, I'm not at all saying that I can relate to how you feel or totally understand how you feel. I, I, I will never. Um, and I think the thing that finally made me even start to see how, how, um, Black people, especially Black women, felt when when women, when white women especially started to be like, oh, now I get it, was during the Me Too movement mm. when it was blowing up all over social media and so many men were saying, really? Like, all of you? Like, so many right. people have a story and I never knew that this was a thing and I'm listening now and I was full of rage. Mm -hmm. I was like, fuck all of you. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. You don't get to, you don't get to congratulate yourself for posting on social media that you're listening and that you need to do. I was so enraged mm -hmm. and I, um, I can't remember who it was that pointed it out, or maybe I just realized it on my own. I can't remember, but I thought, oh my God, this is how Black folks and and the intersection of of black women, both mm -hmm. having the experience of being a woman and being black, have felt for centuries. Yes. Centuries. Yes. Well, and that I mean, I I actually I think that's really valid. And you know, not to promote my podcast, but the when I oh, when, please 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 you're welcome to. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to be a guest anyway, so they're yes, going to have to go and listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I wrote that art. The first article I wrote for HuffPo was about going to Elizabeth Gilbert and Cheryl Strayed's mm -hmm. retreat and yeah. finding myself as the only Black woman among six hundred people. And then the responses from those from from those from that viral article, those responses became the stories that we wanted to tell in the podcast. So if anyone feels like the only one in the room, it certainly doesn't have to be about race. But the the goal was that you see what it felt like. You can kind of maybe get a better understanding of what it felt like for me as a black woman to be in a room with 600 people and be the only one. If you can recognize that you're the only, you were the only woman, you know, or I'm not saying the only woman that you were having this experience as a woman with this huge movement going on and men were just waking up to it or trying to validate mm -hmm. it, you know, and that's like, okay, we, we've been in this fight for a long time and you can't just kind of jump in now. And, you yeah. know, the idea that, um, you know, some, someone can be like the only one who's caring for a dying parent or a dying spouse, that can connect them back to what it feels like to be the only Black person, even though, of course, it's not an equal experience. There's a connection there. So it, it's, not, it's not as much of a burden for me to explain it once somebody can recognize how that feel, how mm -hmm. isolating that can be. You know what I mean? Very, very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think one of the other things that's been, been helpful in, in my journey in this is I took a, um, 
Foundations of Social Justice class by Dr. T. Williams. He's also been a guest and it was, it was enormously helpful. And he still has the class. I'll, I'll drop that link in the show notes. And he, and I, oh my gosh, memory might not be serving. I, I don't, if I'm giving him credit for something he didn't teach me, it was, it was some amazing black person <laughs> talked about this. And I, I can't remember who it was, but it was about how white women, how one of the other reasons that, that black women tend to not trust white women is because for so long, um, and I, and I don't want to speak completely generally here, but many, many, many white women have chosen their race over womanhood. They've chosen whiteness over mm. womanhood and turned their backs on, on black women. When we know what it feels like to be in a marginalized group, like right. as women right. and I can't remember who it said, who said it, but there's a, a quote or a meme or something that floats around about how we we definitely quit trusting you when you sewed the when you sewed the Ku Klux Klan hoods for your for your husbands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. Um it's I, I have come to realize that it's a it's a pain and trauma that runs very, very deep, older than you and I. Yeah. And it, it's something that, it, again, if we don't talk about it, I'm always, and I don't know, maybe this comes for being in the rooms of recovery mm-hmm. <laughs> where I've built up a tolerance for having these really uncomfortable conversations that, you know, until we learn to talk about these things, whether it's here on the podcast and people are just listening to a conversation or they're having the conversations with their their white friends or their black friends and it's Dr. T actually that, that told us uh, it, you, if you have black friends and they're not talking to you about race, yes. you don't have black friends, you have black acquaintances. Right. Right. I say that all the I time. Mm-hmm. I do. It's because mm-hmm. it, it's, you agree with that. Oh, completely. It's so true. Yeah. All I do with my black friends is talk about race. When my family, I have five brothers, um, three of them live, well, two of them live in Florida. One lives in Georgia, really close to the border of Florida. And when they come here, it's, you know, four days or five days of talking about race as a group. My poor white boyfriend, um, he's he's the only one in the room then when my whole family's here. He's great, yeah. though. I mean, he he's in it too, and he participates. And of course, you know, he has to kind of play for the other side in the, during some of these conversations. But it's, it's, you know, it's something that we have to deal with every day. I I go out in the world and, you know, like you, I'm a woman in recovery. I'm, I'm a mom. I'm, um, I'm in an interracial relationship. You know, I'm all these things when, you know, when, or if I ever get pulled over or someone sees me in line at checkout, they don't see any of that. All they see is a black woman. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then they might look at other stuff, you know, they might look to assess me you know, um, my height or, you know, and what's really interesting to me is that um, during these periods of civil unrest and and cultural reckoning, I found that I I am perceived as more threatening. And I can only tell this from people's body language. And, And like you were talking about the Black women when you went for your run, like not making eye contact or lowering their eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, White people are doing that to me. And not not all the time and and certainly not the majority of them but when it when they're when we're not in these periods I don't notice that and I notice it a lot more yeah. that there is something threatening about my just being black right now mm-hmm. which is really interesting to me um and so yes we talk about race all the time I I I can't I mean I can write without writing about race but it's very difficult it's it just pours out of me. And, yeah. and my white friends are in those conversations because if they're not, I'm, you know, if I'm not discussing it with them, they are my acquaintances. I have definitely been in that place where my paycheck ran out before the next one got here. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earnin. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck, then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next 
paycheck. You can use Earnin to pay for a girl's night out, a last minute gift for a loved one, or even summer camp for the kids. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E A R. N-I-N in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in noise under podcast when you sign up. It really, really helps the show. Noise under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. It's hard to find a great mentor who can help me level up. My dream mentor, Shonda Rhimes. So I was really excited when I heard she has a class on Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best. Masterclass is the only streaming platform where you can learn and grow with over 200 plus of the world's best. For just $10 a month, an annual membership with Masterclass gets you unlimited access to every instructor. And you can access Masterclass on your phone, computer, smart TV, or even in audio mode. I'm always looking for ways to be a better writer, so I took Shonda Rhimes' screenwriting class. It helped me gain concrete technical advice, including structuring, the writing process, and with shows under her belt like Grey's Anatomy and Bridgerton, it was so helpful. Plus, every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Don't wait another moment to start your learning journey with Masterclass. Right now, our listeners get an additional 15% off any annual membership at masterclass.com slash Andrea. That's 15% off at masterclass.com slash Andrea. Masterclass.com slash Andrea. You mentioned your boyfriend. Yes. Um, his name's Scott, right? He is. Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. I'm like, am I just making that <laughs> up? Or um, I, there's just, there's one more question I want to ask you about a piece of writing that you that you did, and, mm-hmm. and you've written about him in a couple of different articles. But this particular one, I, I believe that it's called "I Love My White Boyfriend," but there's one thing he'll never understand. Yes. You were speaking to that a little bit just now, but can you can you tell us about that article and what that one thing is? Yeah. Well, first of all, that was that wasn't my headline. Um, so, it wasn't. No, there, there's never my headlines. That one didn't really. Well, look, look, I'll I'll tell you. It, it was it was similar to what I was going. I what I was saying that we couldn't share this is what I was saying. Um, okay. And they they that just felt more clickbaity. I think. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, tough pose. Yeah. Because you know. yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the biggest response I get. It was like. Give him a chance to understand, and maybe he could understand. <laughs> like I they didn't read the that. article. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my boyfriend and I, um, it, it, it honestly feels so odd to say boyfriend when we're in our fifties, but um, when we're grown women, <laughs> it does. It's like weird, um, but we're not married, and we've been together for over twelve years. Um, the entire length of my sobriety, we met the first day we checked into treatment. And uh, he saved my life in there. Uh, I was at my absolute lowest point. I was going to bail and go grab some drugs and a bottle from somewhere and check into a hotel in Wickerburg, Arizona, where we were. And there was just something about his presence that allowed me to stay there. And he and I remained friends for a while. And then he moved to LA and because he lived in Utah at the time. And we dated for six years. And then we moved in together and he is the absolute love of my life. He is my partner in every way. And um, he's truly, besides my dad, I have to say that because my dad would kill me, the kindest man I know. (laughs) Um, And yet, as these, these murders started to happen at the beginning of 2020 or, you know, first quarter, second quarter of 2020, there was a divide between the two of us and um, it wasn't something that he could, he could comfort me about in the way that he normally does with things because he wasn't experiencing it the same way that I was. And he, he can't because he's white Mm -hmm. and he, he grew up in Virginia, which of course is the seat of the Confederacy. He grew up in Richmond. Um, And then he moved to Utah and, and, and actually, you know, to his credit, he left Richmond because he did not 
like the way that that the way that race relations were at that point, and this was years and years ago, and Richmond's a lot different now. Um, but he he felt um, he felt very drawn to the neutral in in the kind of the race war that existed there, and he didn't know why because everyone that he was surrounded with, um, you know, used the N word regularly and you know hated black people and blah blah blah, and he grew up amongst all these people, and then he didn't feel that way. So he moved and then he found me the way I described. And it was, um, it was really difficult. It was difficult to sit on that sofa with him and feel like a plexiglass wall had erected between us while we were watching the events unfold on television, you know, beginning with Ahmaud Aubrey Steph who was killed after Breonna Taylor, but I didn't know about Breonna Taylor until after Ahmaud Aubrey. And then um, when, once George Floyd was murdered, like I said, the way he was murdered and the pain that it caused me, you know, I, honestly, I, I really, I, I just wanted, I just only wanted to see Black people and talk to them about what had happened. And it wasn't even a want, it was more of an instinct. And it wasn't like I didn't want to see Scott. I mean, we lived together and I love him and I love being with him. And, but for that, I needed other black people. And um, I know that hurt his feelings because it was the one area where he couldn't be what he had been. He couldn't be my partner in that. And I wrote about it because mm-hmm. I didn't know how to bridge it. Like it's not tied up yeah. in a bow, that article. I, I wrote it in, as I was experiencing it, which is unusual for me. I usually write things later on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and like maybe there are other people who were feeling the way I was. And apparently there were quite a lot of them because I got a lot of feedback on that article. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have So you wrote that, I, th- I believe it was in May of uh-huh. 2020. Yeah. Do you think things have changed since then? Since you like, what's, did that article help you process anything as a couple or individually, or do you think you're in the same place? Um, certainly it helped us process a lot. And, um, you know, he, he's in recovery as well. And he, he was able to kind of do his own work around those feelings of, it felt like a rejection to him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I'm so grateful to him that he's done this work so that he can show up for me in a way that is, um, that, that feels, that doesn't feel like he's, he's attempting to change how I'm feeling. Um, and and that's really hard to do. It's hard to show up for somebody that you love that's in pain and not try to make it better for them. But yeah. he's done a lot that's of work. Some PhD level work. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? It is absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so he's able to do more of that. And I'm able to let him in more to a certain extent. And I actually just wrote a piece that's coming out today, I think, about when, you know, they stormed the Capitol. Um you know, the, the, what is that? The second week of January of mm-hmm. 2021, I, I was able to get on an emergency BIPOC meeting, you know, a uh, black indigenous people of color meeting, recovery meeting on zoom that I got a notification for as it was happening. And I, I felt exactly the same way I did when George Floyd was murdered as this was happening. And Scott mm-hmm. was right downstairs in his office and I couldn't go to him. And then this meeting popped up. And there were over a hundred black faces on there sharing in this experience. And I was, I don't know if the, I, I wasn't soothed, but I felt seen and I could witness, I felt witnessed um, mm-hmm. in a way that he could not witness for me. And then after that, I went down and shared the experience with him and allowed him to be whatever he needed to be for me in that moment. Yes. I appreciate you sharing that very intimate snapshot mm-hmm. of of your relationship and and the nuances of it. Thank you. Um yeah, it it reminds me of and this is is it's not a comparison. Um I remember when I was first sober and I I think I had 6 months and I was so excited and proud of myself and my husband and he knows better now, but <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't, I think I told him and he just, 
kind of didn't blow it off, but just wasn't excited. And my husband is not very demonstrative anyway. Mm-hmm. Like we would win the lotto and he'd be like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't emote like I do. Like yeah. I'm very, like, you know, you, you know, you don't have to guess what I'm feeling, but I was so disappointed at his reaction that he wasn't throwing confetti for me and, and, you know, like having a parade down the street. And one of my friends in recovery, she said, he'll never understand because he's not an addict. Mm-hmm. And the people in the rooms are the ones who are going to show up for you and get you a cake and, and pat you on the back and hug you and all of these things. And, and it was, it was helpful for me to not only accept that, but also have that conversation with my husband Yeah, and just tell him like, it hurts my feelings. And at the same time, I understand you'll never be as excited as I need you to be because you don't fully understand what it's like to be where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I think that's really similar. And, and I've, I had that experience as well, not with Scott, obviously, but like with my, my parents who were lovely, but it's not the things that are huge milestones for, for us in recovery. Well, I, I'm sorry. My dad's in recovery. <laughs> sorry, dad. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. He's like 37 years sober. Um, <laughs> but my mom, it's a long time. It's a long time. <laughs> my mom. Um, you know, it's, she tries, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah. You know, I, it's again, it's that witness, right? Mm-hmm. Those are the mm-hmm. people in recovery are the ones who witness for me. And, and I get yes. to reflect that back to them. For sure. Have you, did you ever get a chance to watch the show, Dear White People? I watch, I haven't watched the show. I watched the movie. Okay. Yeah. There's the series on, I think it was on Netflix. It's on Netflix. It Netflix? Yeah. It's like several seasons. It was I want to watch it again because I feel like their conversations and the wisdom that is dropped in these conversations, and they talk very fast too. And I'm like, I need to pause Mm. because that whole thing could be a thesis like on its own. Mm. But uh, one of the main characters, her name is Samantha. She has a white boyfriend and they're in college. And uh, I think his name is Gabe, the character's name. And it's, it's, uh, it's always a topic. It seems to, so I get it. Like it seems to always be a topic and, it, I think it's such an important show for white people to watch. And it, I learned so much. And I mean, for what it's worth, everybody, the, all the people are beautiful in that show. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else is gorgeous, gorgeous humans are in that show. The acting is stellar and the lessons are very, very much worth watching and 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 taking in. Um, I believe it's still on Netflix, but yeah, I, I, I could talk to you. Yeah, 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 it's it's good. It's really good. I think we have a couple episodes left to to watch. It it sort of got a little bit strange with like secret societies and stuff, and and I, so we need to circle back to it. But <laughs> I could talk to you all day long, Miss Laura. Yeah. And is there anything else you wanna you wanna close with that you you felt like you didn't get a chance to say? Boy, girl, you were so thorough. Um, you you <laughs> seriously like you you kind of helped cover. me cover everything that I wanted to say. Um, I mean, I think that what I what I really like to say is is really just to thank you again for having this conversation with me and, you know, with the platform that you have. And like I said, the audience that you have and to all you beautiful women listening, this is this is important shit. And, you know, mm-hmm. as as even though I wrote that article that said, I'm not sure I trust you just yet. I we can't do this without you. And, you know, don't don't be put off by the response of people who are wounded like me, who need a little time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't need your help. It doesn't mean that it is not welcome. It just means that you have to do some of it on your own. And, and you know, and then we come together at a certain point and we do it together. But, but I really appreciate you, Andrea. And I, I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm blown away that you've given so much time and attention to this. And I, I, I'm glad, I'm glad to be a part of it. It, You're welcome. And I, I feel, um, I feel the discomfort of being thanked for it. (laughs) And to me, it felt like such uh, a calling of, uh, you know, I can, and it was, it was other white women who called me in, you know, back in, 2015. And Mm -hmm. at at first I bristled Mm -hmm. and, and thought, you don't get to tell me how to run my business. And that was all of my white fragility speaking and all of my ego and all of my shame. And once I worked my way through that, 
Um, and I thank the tools that I have, the resilient, the shame resilience that I have learned, mm. the, the, the lessons I've learned in the rooms of recovery have been hugely helpful in this conversation. And, and I knew on a gut level that I could not continue to do this work publicly anymore without having this difficult, but important, I mean, important doesn't even the right word. It, and it's a, an, an essential conversation. Yeah. Because as I've said many times, and I'm, I'm going to keep repeating it, especially when my next book comes out, when we're talking about women's empowerment, we're talking about feminism. And if we're talking about feminism, we're talking about patriarchy. And if we're talking about patriarchy, we're talking about white supremacy. Mm. So it's all connected mm. and we can't pretend that it's Go not. Ahead. Snap, so, snap, snap. <laughs> we can't pretend that it's not. And, and so with that being said, I am going to sign off. Thank you so much for being here. Thank and you remember again. everyone- it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. See you next time. Thank you for listening to your Kick-Ass Life podcast. If you'd like some extra support, we would love to see how we can help you. You can apply for private coaching by simply texting the word apply to 33777 and the link will be sent to you. I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts.